welcome back to my channel. My name is Rachel, and that is the R in the RK Stumbling Bear, and I am a reader and a writer. And I am back for another weekly wrap-up. Before I jump into the books, I do want to say that my videos might become more sporadic than they already are, just because we are doing more visits with the child we are interested in adopting, and that really is my primary focus over filming. I'll still continue to read, and so when I do have videos, you, there might be more bi-weekly wrap-ups, and then in that case, it's going to look like I read a lot, but it'll be over a greater period of time. So now, jumping into my reading. This past week, I finished four things, and the first thing I finished is The Mighty Nine, Backstory of Ford Stone, and this is a graphic novel. This also works as my February prompt for Somber Honey Books Reading Challenge, which was to read something with the character's name in the title. So Ford Stone, it's about Ford. I have not finished watching The Mighty Nine campaign, but I enjoy it, and so I was curious to find out a little bit more about the backstory. I have to, I'm, I'm in the middle. So I at least have an idea of a lot of their backstories already. So this was kind of just nice to see, oh, this is how he got on to the ship and what it meant to actually be there before he became on a revenge quest. So that was a lot of fun. Then I finished The Pono Way by Kirsten M. Corby. And this was one of the self-published science fiction contest semi-finalists that my group was given to read. And I think it was the one I was most interested in reading. Because it, the subtitle was a solar punk novel. I was a little disappointed because the writing style of it is very much telling you what's happening versus allowing you to move with the character through the actions. It gets better in the last third of the book, but honestly, if I wasn't reading it for a contest, I would have put it down sooner. Overall, I ended up liking it, but it just, because of the writing style, it was okay. However, the message was interesting, and the fu near future world that this is set in, the technology, the idea of the artificial island, I liked all of that. There will be a review coming for this soon. I've already filmed it, so that is something that will be coming out in the near future. Then I finished Full Moon by Jim Butcher. This is number two in his Dresden Files. This is a series that I hear a lot of people enjoy. It's an urban fantasy about a wizard in modern day Chicago, or at least contemporary Chicago. This is written before cell phones were really popular and a thing. So it does mention phone booths, so a younger audience might not know what a phone booth is, but I am an older audience, and I do. So it works for me. I know there's a lot of complaints that in Butcher's writing, Dresden is very much um, focused on female bodies and sex, and there are some gratuitous things in here. Like at one point there's werewolf sex, which was just completely random. At full moon, it has werewolves in it. It was an interesting concept, and Butcher really doesn't hold anything back in this one. It goes dark and gruesome fast. People who you wanted to be safe are not safe, which really makes me curious what's going to happen further on in the series. I'm not fully invested in this series, so I'm probably not going to run, run out and grab the third book right away, but I will eventually read it. And then the last thing I finished was a short story called The Interlopers. And I've, I've been watching Locus Magazine's award list listings because it's March. The Nebula nominations are going to be coming out, and I'm curious what those are going to be. There's a list that was doing short stories, and so I was like, all right, I'll, I need to get in the habit of reading short stories again. So I kind of saved them on my computer and started going for them. 
and this was one of the ones that had been nominated for an award. Now the award it's nominated for is not, or it takes from a longer period of time, because this story came out in 2018. So The Interlopers is set on a colony that is separated from Earth, la big long distance. <laughs> so then the com their communication with Earth takes decades to ask questions, to communicate information with them. Because of that, their society has really changed according to the needs that this population has. And we start off following a man who his wife has just entered into agreement with another woman for her also to be his wife, which then I guess gives him prestige in the community, which means he is looked at to be virile and can father many children, which is something their community is lacking in. As he is excited about this second marriage, he goes out to gaze upon the night sky and see something in the sky that looks very different. It looks like a star that they normally see has gone out and then it's back again. But it looks like now something else is next to it. And so he's curious what's going on and over the, their nights are a lot longer than earth nights. So throughout the night he goes and checks and then throughout some more time and yeah, ends up something is coming their way. I'm debating on whether or not just to tell you what's going on. No, I'm not going to tell you. If you're interested, I will leave the link to the sh short story down below. But the story is more of a reflective. It is this character who I don't think we ever get his name, but it is his perception of what's going on. Or it's, no, it it's his memories that are being recorded that he is sharing with other people to preserve what happened and why that was important for their community and how it's shaped them as a community and as a people, given them their own mythos, which I thought was an interesting take. So like I said, that story will be linked down below in the show notes. And if I forget, just remind me, please. Sometimes I get everything uploaded and forget to add the show note elements that I mentioned in the video. So then for what I am currently reading, this was a week where there was more of a lot of sampling. Um, I did continue reading in Crucible, or yeah, The Crucible to Hell. Forgot to bring the book in with me. I then started reading Light Blade by Zamil Akhtar. That is the next, that is another book for the self-published science fiction contest. Uh, if you had watched my initial thoughts. This is one that I was getting fantasy vibes from the cover, but the first two chapters very much are dealing with a technology where human bodies have been upgraded to have like a stone a chat attached to their chest that allows them to augment their reality. Like the first aspect we see is a dream stone and then in your dreams you can experience things um, like, for example, for every hour you're asleep, it's a day in the dream world. And then when he wakes up, you see him change out his crystal for something that allows him his body to absorb uh, green light from the sun. So that then is used to power machinery. It, it's an interesting concept. I can You can kind of see where it has some fantasy elements as well. But right now, I really am getting more of a sci-fi vibe from it. Again, I've only read the first two chapters, so... that From what I've heard from other people, I guess more fantasy elements seem to kind, kind of come out. But I don't know. We shall see. And then I picked up and read like the first four chapters of Saint Death's Daughter by C.S. Cooney. This is a book that is on my own personal reading challenge the 2000 to 2023. Unfortunately, I have to take it back to the library today, so it, it's going to probably be a couple months before I get it up and can actually finish it. But the writing has definitely caught my eye. I, I had heard from a lot of people that the writing was very lyrical, and they even sometimes thought it had gone into purple prose. I don't think it, it is that bad, but it is 
it is very lyrical and it does the, the character does describe things in like poetic language however the descriptions seem to fit the character and her perception of the world so it doesn't bug me and I'm interested in what's going to happen and if you are a first time viewer I do cheat I do read to the end of books to like the last couple chapters to after reading the first couple chapters to see if I want to get through the book because for example this is a big thick book and I do and it kind of seems like this book probably could have been more than one or could have been a series it seems like the character is going to have several roller coaster arcs throughout this book so I'm very curious since this is going back to the library my plans for this next week is to con continue reading Light Blade by Zamil Akhtar. And I know it's another chunky book, so I don't know if I'll finish it this week, but I do want to continue reading it. Continue reading Crucible. Continue reading Space Craze. And then because it seems like either I'm reading heavy nonfiction or I'm reading chunky, fantasy, uh, chunky genre books, to give me something short that I actually might finish this week, I'm looking at picking up Arbo Reality by Rebecca Campbell. And this is a novella that I heard of through the Lo Locust Magazine's like reward nominations. And it was published in 2022. So by reading it, then it gives me an, another option for the Hugos and also, or also for the Christinellis. So, and I haven't heard anybody else read this. So I'm curious what it's gonna be about. For my writing wrap-up, I did not write. However, I did sign up to attend Pro Writing Aid's Fantasy Week. Unfortunately, due to my work schedule, I am watching everything on replay, so I've watched two of the episodes from the first day that I was interested in. One of them was the interview with Travis Baldry, who wrote Legends and Lattes, which I read around September of 2022 and really enjoyed it. He's also a voice actor, so a lot of his interview was also talking about that. And But then just talking about his writing process, and he talks about how he's an older writer, which gives me hope because I'm an older writer. And yeah, it was it was informative, and it was just really nice to see and of course everybody's writing journey is different from what I have seen but still very interesting and I have learned exactly how much self-published authors have to pay for their audiobooks and so I have a greater respect for when they don't have an audiobook or when they choose to have an audiobook I now know how much they are spending I'm not normally an audiobook person myself, but I, I didn't have a concept of how much the cost was before. So now that I do, whew. And then the other episode I watched was talking about curio fiction, which made me think of magical realism, but she did a really good job of defining how it would, how magical realism could be another subgenre alongside of it. Basically a curio fiction, as was described, it is a world that is like ours with one thing changed. She gave a lot of examples, literary and film as well. For example, she gave the example of Groundhog Day and how the one thing changed was he had to repeat the day, but otherwise it was the same. And so I've definitely seen this in a lot of different things that I have read that are more contemporary, but then have like that slight magical element. Kind of reminds me also of like Mr. Penun. Mr. Penumbra's <sighs> Yeah. So it kind of reminds me also of like Mr. Penumbra's 24 hour bookshop bookstore where it seems like the regular world but then these people are trying to find books to give them a greater meaning in life. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm guessing like that shop would be kind of a curio or everything. At least that's what it reminded me of. It wasn't one of the examples she actually used, but yeah. 
Um, yeah, so I'm planning to continue watching the sessions that I'm interested in from that week. And for other media, I finally finished Warehouse 13. And Warehouse 13, you can tell, was planned to be a, a five-season arc. From my film studies, that is something they talked about, is most TV shows are planned for a five-season arc. And then, so when they get canceled after a season or two, that's... You don't get, then, the full arc. Now, and sometimes I think that the one season or two season arc is stronger. And this is completely like my own personal feelings, but I didn't like how the series ended. I could see very much where they are, they were wrapping things up, wrapping up storylines. Um, all of a sudden, the two main characters had to realize that they loved each other and could were going to be planned to be together in the end. Yeah, just there's different choices I think that they made in that final season that I wasn't a fan of. Like they like for one of the other like major characters, they also introduced a sister she didn't know. Like, I mean, yeah, a sister which I guess they had mentioned at the beginning had died in a car crash, but then all of a sudden she's still alive, and this is why she's been hidden away and all this stuff. And I, the last season kind of felt more like they were grasping for the same magic and awe from the first the couple seasons, the, I think the very beginning, but because it, since so many of their seasons were ending with like death and destruction or someone's trying to destroy the world, they moved away from the awe the wonder and awe, which is what I think that the central story was actually about. And, and since I finished uh, watching it, I could definitely tell when it was, uh, when the episode was the normal series writer, because the main characters, you could see like their emotional progression versus when it was probably a guest writer or someone they were trying to give practice to, because then all of a sudden the main characters became more caricatures of each of their person. For example, we have the main, one of the main characters name is Pete and he's kind of known as someone who likes women and he thinks that he's, you know, hot stuff and women like him back. And that is kind of, that is kind of his personality as he is searching for, like, as he is going through the series. But he never like, it's over, overstates it. But when it's a guest writer, all of a sudden he's like, oh, look, boobs. Oh, look, you know, I'm now horny because somebody said something like that. And it's like, ah, you, 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 no, you, you missed what actually makes him who he is. When it was a main writer, he never objectified his female colleagues. He wasn't looking at their tits or the bodies or making lewd jokes to them because they felt comfortable with him. They kind of treated him like a brother. And you're not going to do that to someone who is objectifying you sexually. And with Micah's personality, I, she wouldn't have been able to work with somebody who was doing that to her anyway. And then with Micah, you know, she's smart, she's savvy, she's fierce, she knows what who she is, and she doesn't, you know, hide behind it. But when she became a caricature of herself, it was, nope, we have to follow the rules. It's all about this. How dare you, you know try to follow your gut or anything like that. Whereas in the nor normal series, she's like, okay, here are the rules. Wait, you have something, you have a gut thing going on? Well, I've learned to trust you. I, you know, still looking within the rules, what is your gut telling us so that we can adjust? She was more natural. So I could tell those deviations in the writing. I think the actors did a good job playing the part that they were given, but you could tell the deviations in the writing. They had a lot of fun, like, sci-fi fantasy TV regulars that we see from other shows. I liked how Where House 13 and Eureka was in the same universe, world universe. That was kind of fun to see. I liked getting to see Fargo. And then I know from watching Eureka, 
I actually saw Claudia Donovan come in first and didn't realize that the shows had been kind of going on about the same time and that they, there had already been that crossover. So I was just like, oh, okay, hey, Warehouse 13 exists in this world. That would make sense. They already talked about Area 51 existed. So, yeah, that was a lot of fun. So coming up in the future, I have two science fiction self-published contest books to review that will be coming out. And I still have promised you to know what my favorite January book was and give it a book review. And now since it's March, I have a February one that needs to come out as well. So those are kind of my focuses for what should be coming out here in the near future. Do you have any fun reading plans for March? I'd love to know. Leave me a comment down below. Thank you and have a great day.